Hey, all of you sheepies near and far, welcome to worship whenever you have a chance to view this. Can you believe it is already July? Summer is just zipping along. I think it needs to slow down. Let me pray us in. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. As we continue to talk about this biblical guy named Job, help us to find ourselves in the midst of the story. Help us to have open hearts and open minds as we continue to think on this relationship between us and you, Father God. In your name we pray. Amen. Today is the 2nd of July, 2023. Our message title for today is Audience of One. And we will be in Job chapters 15 through 19. If you want to have your Bibles handy, I'm going to be reading some excerpts from the message translation as we travel along, but it might be kind of nice to have your translation open to Job chapters 15 through 19. We live in a world where information is instantaneous. If we want to know a person or a location or information about something or someone, all we have to do is pull out our smartphones and immediately we have at least some knowledge of who or what we need information about. I don't know about you, but I've been sending a lot of sympathy cards lately and not all addresses are in the phone book anymore. And so sometimes I, I Google an address and I usually get pretty close. I think only one has come back here in the last month or so. We can ask Siri or Google or even Alexa any question like, who constructed Mount Rushmore? I recently watched an excellent documentary about this on PBS. You can find it on the pbs.org. The answer to that question of who constructed Mount Rushmore is a guy by the name of Gutzen Morglum. The thing is, we can ask Siri or Google or Alexa information about someone or something, and we'll likely get an answer, probably a more textbook sort of answer, a definition. But how about if we ask someone who has a personal interest in that person or that thing. We will get a much different answer. We will get passion and emotion and feeling, whether that be positive or negative. So how do we know someone? I have over 2,000 friends on my Facebook friends list, but I certainly know some of those persons, some of those friends better than I know others and them, me. I usually don't deny many friend requests, but I do scope it out usually first. Do we have mutual friends? Does this profile look legit? I figure in some small way, perhaps something that I might post will help others to know the one in whom we really need to know, and that is Jesus the Christ, or at least I hope so. Did you enjoy the, the video that uh, I had on my Facebook page about the kids talking about Jesus? You can scroll down if you missed it. But my thought was, I wonder how they selected the kids that were interviewed, you know? I mean, to me, it didn't seem random. I think these kids were probably church kids. As I was looking for YouTube videos to show about who is Jesus, I, I was looking for some interviews, like uh, random interviews on, on the street, and I, I couldn't find any current ones. found a couple older ones. My hunch is that these kids knew about Jesus through their families and their churches, I honestly, sadly think that there's a higher majority of people of all ages who might know Jesus, but not know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. They may know Jesus, but not in a deep and abiding relational sort of way. Both the prophet Isaiah and the apostle Paul write about beautiful feet, bringing this beautiful message of good news 
We have work to do in carrying the message about Jesus, do we not? We're going to get an answer, a textbook definition, if we say, who is Jesus? If we ask Siri or Google or Alexa, we'll get that textbook answer. But until we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, as our Redeemer, we aren't really going to know, you know? Where we last left off with our friend Job, he's just really tired of his friend's advice. But they keep on talking, don't they? They keep on talking, as will be the case today, too. We left off in Job chapter 15. Job's friends have not been comforting to him. In fact, he tells them, why did you come here? Because you have been no help to me. They have accused Job of sin. Well, Job, you must have done something to deserve this plight, they say. Just fess up and ask God forgiveness for forgiveness. They're so worried about themselves here. Not about their buddy Job. Where we last left off in chapter 14, Job is asking God to please hear his case. Almost like a courtroom of such. Our message was, may the defendant approach the bench. His friends have advised him against his plan to approach the almighty judge, God. But Job is in this place where he can do nothing else, even if it means death. Job is just that desperate. Today we continue on with much of the same here in chapters 15 through 19. But when we get to chapter 19, we're going to get some good words from Job that we can all rest in. So as we journey along today, I'd invite you be, to be thinking about how do I know Jesus? How do I know Jesus? How do I really know Jesus? This is a question that we ask our confirmation students to articulate. And maybe you can write this down at home. Who is Jesus? And you write some words down, some thoughts, and tuck it away in your Bible. Are you ready to get back into Job? Then here we go. Chapter 15. We hear from friend Eliphaz, the termite. I always think termite because he's kind of a, a, a termite sort of guy. And he speaks again. This is the second cycle of speeches. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. He says this. If you were truly wise, he's addressing Job now. If you were truly wise, would you sound so much like a windbag belching hot air? Would you talk nonsense in the middle of a serious argument, babbling baloney? Look at you, you trivialize religion. Turn spiritual conversation into empty gossip. It's your sin that taught you to talk this way. You choose an education in fraud. Your own words have exposed your guilt. It's nothing I've said. You've incriminated yourself. Do you think you're the first person to have to deal with these things? Have you been around as long as the hills? Were you listening in when God planned all of this? Do you think you're the only one who knows anything? What do you know that we don't know? What insights do you have that we've missed? Ooh. In other words, friend Eliphaz is chastising Job again. Job, who do you think you are to question God? And he's angered because Job refuses to listen to their so-called wise counsel, his buddy's wise counsel. We get an image of a battlefield scene of sorts, God versus evil, and no one ever winning against God. God is victorious. And anyone who tries to go to war with God is like a conquered city, having been pushed to the ground, never to rise again. And all that is left is foolish trust. This, according to Eliphaz, is all that Job has left. Foolish trust. But hang on, friends, because that foolish trust will be enough. Remember faith like a mustard seed? It's like if someone says to us, I don't understand your faith in God. You praise him in the midst of adversity. 
Yes, this is the trust of Job, his God. It is the trust in our God too. So let's hear what Job has to say in response to his friend. This is Job speaking now, chapter 16, verses 8 through 17. 16, 8 through 17. Job says, when I speak up, I feel no better. If I say nothing, that doesn't help either. I feel worn down. God, you have wasted me totally, me and my family. You shriveled me like a dried prune, showing the world that you're against me. My gaunt face stares back at me from the mirror, a mute witness to your treatment of me. Your anger tears at me, your teeth rip me to shreds, your eyes burn holes in me. God, my enemy, people take one look at me and gasp. Contemptuous, they slap me around and gang up against me. And God just stands there and lets them do it. Let's wicked people do what they want with me. I was contentedly minding my own business when God beat me up. He grabbed me by the neck and threw me around. He set me up as his target, then rounded up archers to shoot at me. Merciless, they shot me full of arrows. Bitter bile poured from my gut to the ground. He burst in on me, onslaught after onslaught, charging me like a mad bull. I sewed myself a shroud and I wore it like a shirt. I lay face down in the dirt. Now my face is blotched red from weeping. Look at the dark shadows under my eyes, even though I've never heard a soul and my prayers are sincere. Job more or less says to his friends, this is all so easy for you, isn't it? It's so easy for them to make accusations and to point fingers and speak with such confidence because they aren't the ones going through this stuff. They aren't the ones suffering. Ever come across a friend like this? And you know that inside they're saying, man, I'm, I'm glad that's them and not me. I'm glad it's Job and not me. Job blames God for having to endure these verbal insults from these so-called friends. Ever feel all alone in the world? Here's Job. Verse 11 says, God has turned me over to evil men. Have you ever had that talk with God? You know the one. God, why are you doing this to me? I feel all alone. My friends just don't get it. In fact, it makes it worse. Yeah, me too. But Job declares his innocence and that his prayers before God are pure. He doesn't have anyone who supports his defense and he's at the pit of despair. So chapter 17, scoot on over to chapter 17. And so here, Job prays for relief. Are you ready for some relief? <laughs> Me too. Job sure is. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. This is Job speaking again, okay? My spirit is broken, he says. My days are used up. My grave dug and waiting. See how these mockers close in on me? How long do I have to put up with their insolence? Oh God, plead your support for me. Give it to me in writing with your signature. You're the only one who can do it. These people are so useless. You know firsthand how stupid they can be. You wouldn't let them have the last word, would you? Those who betray their own friends leave a legacy of abuse to their children. God, you've made me the talk of the town. People spit in my face. I can hardly see from crying so much. I'm nothing but skin and bones. Decent people can't believe what they're seeing. The good-hearted wake up and insist I've given up on God. I especially like verse six here. Might read a little different in your translation. God, you have made me the talk of the town. The message version reads, God has made me a byword to everyone. A different translation. 
Job is feeling like an afterthought here. Have you ever felt like an afterthought? Or something has happened in your life and all of a sudden now everyone is gossiping about you or your family. It isn't a pleasant place to be. So here is this guy who had it all. He had all the cattle and all the sheep and all the servants and all the steaks on the grill, a little red meat and romance at the end of the day, all the while praising God. He had some no good partying kids who spent all his money, but Job, Job was righteous. Job was righteous and he cries out, why, oh God, have you made me an afterthought now? It reminds me of the hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. We sang that last week. You know, Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Don't pass me by, God. Don't pass me by. God, I don't understand that while they spit on me, you turn away. I was sharing this with my good friend, Pastor Velda, a few days ago, that one of my prayers was more like a question. Hey God, why do those who are so deceptive and sneaky get by? I was kind of playing God there, wasn't I? But in all honesty, don't you also ask that question sometimes? When you know that persons are doing all kinds of sneaky and deceptive sort of things and kind of pulling the wool over, God, why doesn't that person get caught? Then I back off and pray, change my heart, oh God. But man, in that moment, right? I think we can relate to this at some times in our lives. And, and then in verse 10, Job has pretty much had it with these, these friends of his. And he, he says to his friends, okay, bring it on. Come on, try again. I'm not dead yet. And again, he cries out to God to either give him an assurance of his innocence or give him death. Chapter 18, we get to hear from friend Bildad again. Verses 1 through 4. This is Bildad's second attack, plunged from light into darkness. He says, how monotonous these word games are getting. Get serious. We need to get down to business. Why do you treat your friends like slow-witted animals? You look down on us as if we don't know anything. Why are you working yourselves up like this? Do you want the world redesigned to suit you? Should reality be suspended to accommodate you? Bildad is so sure that Job is just out of his mind, that he's being stubborn. Job, be sensible. Then we can talk. We can offer some, good more, some more good advice, right? He's preaching, preaching to Job here about his mistakes, whatever they are. Job is still innocent in all of this, and we need to remember in Scripture, both God and Satan have been silent from the very first scene in the opening chapter. But be assured, there's a battle going on in the heavenly realms for God's servant Job, as well as for you and me, as we are tried and tested in this life. God does not shut his eyes. Although sometimes it can sure feel like that when we are smack dab in the thick of it, whatever the thick of it is, nothing in our lives goes unnoticed. We don't get the answer to the why bad things happen to good people, even as we so want to know. God has his reasons, and so then we must hold steady. Bildad's words are even worse. In each round in speaking to Job, he just amps it up more. And they continue to break Job in pieces with their words. The sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. That's a load of junk, right? Because words can hurt. Words can hurt. I don't know about you, but 
It's like I would like to reach into this story and remove that big old log out of each one of these friends' eyes, wouldn't you? Do you find yourself defending Job here? This action on behalf of Job's friends is certainly not edifying to the life of the church. When someone is down and out and we are called as believers to build them back up, not tear them down. When Job had it all, these buddies of his were right there as the ribeyes came off the grill and the wine was flowing freely. But how about now? Instead, they are the first ones to throw stones, to point fingers, and to gossip. They're not being Christ-like, and neither are we when we do such things. We've most likely encountered that. Perhaps we've been guilty of tossing a stone or two ourselves and saying within our heart, man, I'm glad that's not me. Glad that's not my kid. Glad that's not my family. All the while forgetting our own scratches and dents and imperfections in the process. It should give us pause, friends. Before we speak, before we act, before we speak anything, we need to say, is this life-giving? Ask ourselves the question, is this life-giving? Does me sharing this information help this person or hurt them further when they are down? At some point in our lives, we all fall down. At some point in our lives, we all fall down. And I pray others are grace-filled with me, and I think you all pray that others are grace-filled with you when it happens. And if we can't be grace-filled, we need to just be quiet instead. Take it to God in prayer. Chapter 19, we finally get to chapter 19, and I want us to look at this and reread it again at home if you can. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Job is speaking again, and he answers his friend Bildad. A call for help, and no one bothers, it says. Job answered, how long are you going to keep battering away at me, pounding me with these harrigos? Time after time after time. Notice three times. Time after time after time. He says, you jump all over me. Do you have no conscience abusing me like this? Even if I have somehow or another gotten off the track, what business of that is yours? Why do you insult, insist on putting me down, using my troubles as a stick to beat me? Tell it to God. He's the one behind all this. He's the one who dragged me into the mess. Look at me. I shout murder and I'm ignored. I call for help and no one bothers to stop. God threw a barricade across my path. I'm stymied. He turned out the lights. I'm stuck in the dark. He's destroyed my reputation, robbed me of my self-respect. He tore apart tore me apart piece by piece, I am ruined. And then he yanked out the hope, my hope, by the roots. He's angry with me. Oh, how he's angry. He treats me like his worst enemy. He has launched a major campaign against me, using every weapon he can think of, coming at me from all sides at once. Job says this to his friends. You continue to attack me. And let's just say that if I did sin, then it's my sin. It's between me and God. This is not about his friends. Job is requesting this audience of one between him and God. Chapter 19, verses 13 through 20. Hang on to this. Chapter 19, 13 through 20. I know that God lives. You get some hope. This is Job speaking. God alienated my family from me. Everyone who knows me avoids me. My relatives and friends have all left. House guests forget I ever existed. The servant girls treat me like a deadbeat off the street. Look at me like they've never seen me before. I call my attendant and he ignores me ignores me even though I plead with him. 
My wife can't stand to be around me anymore. I'm repulsive to my family. Even street urchins despise me. When I come out, they taunt and jeer. Everyone I've ever been close to abhors me. My dearest loved ones reject me. I'm nothing but a bag of bones and my life hangs by a thread. Job's feeling pretty hopeless and alone, his breath repulsive to his wife. NRSV will read that way. He wishes that his words could be recorded, chiseled in stone, so that after he's dead, he can still defend his innocence, you see. Chapter 19, 23 through 27. If only my words were written in a book, better yet chiseled in stone, still I know that God lives, the one who gives me back my life, and eventually he'll take his stand on earth, and I'll see him, even though I get skinned alive, see God myself with my very own eyes. Oh, how I long for that day. But more than anything, Job wants to go before God. He wants this audience of one, time alone with God, a time when he can lay his heart out before the Almighty, offering himself as an offering. Sometimes we have to get to that place in order to move forward, the place where we have got nothing left but God. I've seen this on t-shirts with those two words printed on it. I really like it. But God, in quotes, but God. Sometimes when it feels as if the whole world is against us, we get to that point of bringing the only thing that matters before God, us, ourselves, and laying it at God's feet and saying, God, make of me what you will. Everything else is just going through the motions. Some time ago, the church found that their worship service had lost its spark. Senior Pastor Mike Pilvaki said, we seem to be going through the motions, but I noticed that although we were singing the songs, our hearts were far from him. They became too focused on what they liked about the worship service and had forgotten that they were not the audience. God is the audience. Pilvaki says, we were challenged to ask ourselves individually, when I come through the door of the church, what am I bringing as my contribution to worship? The truth came to us. Worship is not a spectator sport. It's not a product molded by the taste of consumers. It's not about what we can get out of it. It's all about God. They did away with the usual format, even did away with the musicians. They began to focus on things that would please God. People began to participate in the worship instead of just being a spectator. Pilvaki comments, the excitement came back. We were not having church. We were once again meeting with God. With all of the comfort stripped away, we worshiped from our heart. And he tells that after the lesson was learned, they brought the musicians back. It was at that point that their worship leader, a young man by the name of Rat Matt Redman, introduced a song that he had written out of this experience titled, The Heart of Worship, which is one of the 10 five, top 10 five worship songs of all time. The lyrics, when the music fades, and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it. It's all about you. 
It's all about you, Jesus. You can YouTube it. Matt sings it much better than I do, but you get the point. When we are at the bottom of the pit, the bottom of the bottom, when all is stripped away and we simply come before our God, requesting this audience of one, it is there that we will know him, really know him. In the midst of everything else, when all is gone, he remains. And here is the verse that we have been waiting for. The verse that we've been holding out hope for in the midst of all of the pain and suffering in verse 25 of chapter 19. Job lifts his head and proclaims, I know that my Redeemer lives. And that in the end, he will stand upon the earth after my skin is destroyed, or as Paul says, the Apostle Paul now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, after this earthly tent in which we live in is taken down. And Job says, Then in my faith I will see God with my own eyes. I and not another. My heart yearns within me. And so when someone asks you, Who is Jesus? What will you say? I pray that you will say, I know that my Redeemer lives. And all God's people say, Amen. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great week. Have a great 4th of July. Be safe. Stay hydrated. Drink your water and Gatorade. We'll see you next time.